Dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure to be with you today, to virtually to discuss cardiovascular risk in people with a type 2 diabetes. These are my conflict of interest. And I would really like to start off with these slides that reports the distribution of initial presentation of cardiovascular disease in people with type 2 diabetes, 30, more than 30,000 of them, as compared to a very large population of people without a diabetes. Then you can appreciate how many of these conditions tend to be uh, more common in people with type 2 diabetes. They can be more common, and this uh, increased rate of presentation of cardiovascular disease can actually be calculated as being done uh, and presented here. So this is the, uh, uh, the hazard ratio for 12 distinct cardiovascular disease in people aged more than 30 years with the diabetes and diabetes as compared to those without diabetes. And you can appreciate that by and large, people with type 2 diabetes have at least twice as much the risk of developing cardiovascular disease, particularly if you do consider those with uh, uh, an atherosclerotic nature. And atherosclerosis is very common in people with type 2 diabetes. In another study that had been analyzed in the population that had been described in more than 57 articles, including a total of more than 4.5 million of people with type 2 diabetes, it has been calculated that at least one third of them already have a cardiovascular disease. So you can easily calculate that one out of three people with type 2 diabetes have established cardiovascular disease. You can see here on the right-hand side of the slides, the prevalence of the different condition. But all that I'd like to point it out to you that when you do consider atherosclerotic condition, atherosclerosis account for 29% of this condition. So you can do a very simple calculation and appreciate how out of those 30% of people with a established cardiovascular disease, uh, nine out of them uh, have uh, established a cardiovascular disease and an atherosclerotic condition. So atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease is very common in people with type 2 diabetes. And this is easy to appreciate if we do consider that type 2 diabetes is not just hyperglycemia, but actually has to be considered a syndromic condition with a multiple factor concurring to generate the atherosclerotic risk and the cardiovascular risk. And this is very uh, been nicely highlighted in this uh, uh, data that really have analyzed a very large population coming from the Northern European countries, analyzing the registry data of those uh, uh, individuals, uh, and, and summarizing what are the, the different cardiovascular people in all patients with the diabetes, um, with and without an established cardiovascular condition. And you can see that there is a large variety, but also I'd like to point it out to you that top of the list are the usual suspects. Here you can see that in all patients, as well as in those with a condition at baseline, glycemic control, solid blood pressure, and LDL cholesterol play a really pivotal role in generating cardiovascular risk in the population. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very large analysis that is a sort of a population data. So it is possible to extract out of this population individuals with the diabetes. And uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, all the cardiovascular risks under control, in particular, you can extract people with a normal A1C, with a normal level uh, of a cholesterol, with a normal administration rate, not smoking, and with a normal blood pressure. And when you do analyze and you do select those people, and you do compare, even with respect to the different uh, um, uh, age uh, uh, strata, uh, what is the risk uh, are for excess mortality, for excess acute myocardial infarction, for excess stroke, and to a less extent for the excess heart failure, you can appreciate how having all these conditions here under control really is associated with no significant increase in the risk of this cardiovascular condition here. These are data that have been generated in a large population but it's sort of a retrospective and is a lot of epi and is a, a, an epidemiological analysis. However, this concept that controlling multiple cardiovascular risk factor can be instrumental in reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease is perfectly in line with a very small, still very powerful 
intervention trial that has been reported now uh, more than 20 years ago. And I'm referring to a study that you know very well, which is the STINO2, in where uh, glycemic control, uh, control and strict control of our cholesterol, triglyceride and blood pressure, and the use of anti agricultural drugs was associated in this small number of individuals as compared to those with conventional therapy in an incredible 53% reduction in the cardiovascular risk. So controlling cardiovascular risk factors on top of controlling glucose uh, uh, levels in people tied to diabetes can be very effective in reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease. However, in spite of the lesson learned, I think that we need to appreciate that we are far from achieving these kind of goals in the general population. And what I'm reporting here are the data of Renan and Haynes. Renan Haynes is a survey that is performed in adults in the United States with respect to a number of different uh, conditions. But what is important here, what is of interest here, is the uh, um, percentage of people achieving a target glycemic control, a target blood pressure control, or a target lipid control in the past 20 years, starting from the period 1999-2000 until just yesterday. And you can appreciate that over the past 20 years or so, there was not very much of a difference in terms of the percentage of people achieving good glycemic control that is no more than 50%. And even uh, in a, a, along the same line, the percentage of people achieving blood pressure control is not exceeding the 50%. And very similar, another 45% of the people do not achieve lipid control here represented by non-HDL cholesterol that you know very well may reflect to a greater extent what is the degree of a li atherosclerotic lipoprotein. But what is even more depressing is that there is only no more than 20% of the people that have all these three factors that we have already seen are quite important in reducing the cardiovascular risk. So much more has to be done. And this is sort of a, 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 a frustrating, uh, consider that these are the main factors, but the new factors may come up and may become more popular and more aggressive in terms of increasing the cardiovascular risk in the diabetic population. Think, for instance, to the uh, interest uh, uh, that we are paying right now uh, with respect to NAFOLD and NASH, as you know very well, NAFOLD not only is associated with an increased risk for evolution of hepatic uh, uh, disease, but also it may most likely contribute to worsen uh, insulin resistance and worsen the inflammatory status that could uh, um, lead to uh, an increased risk of uh, atherosclerosis in people with a type 2 diabetes. And this risk has been actually calculated. Here is an example uh, summarizing 11 studies involving uh, uh, more than 8,000 uh, people and uh, referring to cross-sectional study as well as four studies and reporting that there is not pretty much of a difference between the two uh, because the odds ratio uh, in terms of cardiovascular risk and cardiovascular events that is, can be supported, can be sustained through the NAFOLD and the NASH, it's in the order of two. So NAFOLD and NASH can double the risk associated with type 2 diabetes with respect to cardiovascular disease. But there is even more than that. For instance, there is an effect that is uh, really worsening what is the impact of the traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And here is an example that has been obtained in a large population of people with type 2 diabetes, close to 50,000. And what is represented here by these columns is the, uh, uh, the risk for the primary cardiovascular uh, outcome, uh, in this specific case was cardiovascular mortality and cardiovascular uh, events, that is associated with having uh, under control the three usual suspects, like the hemoglobin, blood pressure, LDL, cholesterol, or having none of them under control with the two intermediate conditions. And you can see that by losing control in one or more of them is associated with an increased risk as expected of cardiovascular disease. But if you really want to highlight, if you really want to magnify this negative impact of the cardiovascular risk factors, you need to take into account the presence of microvascular disease, which is typical of people with type 2 diabetes. And what you can see here is to which extent the presence of one 
or two or three microvascular disease can uh, affect, can increase, to which extent can increase the cardiovascular risk. And you can appreciate that this is an incredible uh, magnifying, unfortunate effect. And this is not uh, too difficult to understand and to appreciate. If we do consider that yet, yes, we are dealing with atherosclerosis process that may affect and actually do affect the epicardial coronary arteries, but we also needed to consider that those epicardial coronary arteries are providing uh, oxygen and nutrients to the muscle, to the heart muscle, to an intricate network of microvessel. So it's easy to appreciate how the microvascular disease, which is a systemic condition in the diabetic population and is reflected by the presence of a specific microvascular complication in people with diabetes can contribute to increase cardiovascular risk in this population. And this not surprising with respect to that, that the current uh, recommendation for stratification of the risk in people with the diabetes or pre-diabetes uh, has been done by the European Society of Cardiology, includes into the elements, the factors that really are used to define the degree of risk, the presence of uh, target organ damage. And with the target organ damage, they are referring to the presence of proteinuria, to the presence of retinopathy, to the presence of impairment of a, a kidney function that really represent the usual, typical, traditional microvascular complication in diabetes. And to this extent, the American uh, Heart Association, in association with the American College of Cardiologists, have been even more explicit because when they do consider and they do list what are the specific risk and answer in diabetes, independent of other risk factors, they really point out to albuminuria, to GFR, to the presence of retinopathy, and to the presence of neuropathy. So we need really to appreciate what is the, uh, uh, the very complex contribution of multiple elements uh, that really lead to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular risk in people with diabetes. And we have come to appreciate that we have no modifiable risk factors like age, gender, and genes, but we have a number of modifiable risk factors that are listed here. And I would like to propose to you that along with these very well-known cardiovascular risk factors, modifiable risk factors, we probably need also to include the presence of microvascular complication, and in particular to consider what is the role uh, of the independent effect of the kidney disease in generating atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And it's just, you know, by considering all these factors that we can appreciate, that we can become aware of what is the progression, the continuum of the cardiovascular risk and the atherosclerotic risk in people with diabetes, as it has been summarized in this uh, very nice picture just uh, uh, very recently published, that point out you know, how the development of the atherosclerotic process leading to the plaque really is the result of the effect of multiple factors, and it's an effect of a building up over the time, not excluding and not ruling out the possibility to have ischemic events, even in the absence of the plaque. So what we are facing here is a, a multifactorial uh, condition really leading to atherosclerotic condition and cardiovascular risk in people with type 2 diabetes. But if that is the case, how can we approach it? Now, we have recently released that the ADA is the consensus of the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And as has been done in the past, we have really focused our attention on the personal needs and goals of care for people with type 2 diabetes. What we have been suggesting, however, is that in defining what is the strategy for approaching treatment of type 2 diabetes with the, with the, with the goal of reducing the risk of a chronic complication, microvascular and microvascular complication, we need to consider multiple factors all of them all together and not really establishing any specific ranking in terms of what is the potential effect of these elements. And that's why we picked up the, the circle because 
doesn't matter where you start from, you ended up from the starting point all the time in this circulating way of analyzing the risk in people with diabetes. And this, in, in, and this uh, includes the, the need for glycemic control, the need for weight man management, the need for uh, dealing and tackling of cardiovascular risk factors, and to take into consideration the presence of an organ damage. Of course, this is done to a number of principal cares that I'm not going to really discuss here to, uh, with you today. But what really it's it's the message here is that if you really wanted to reduce the burden of complication in people with diabetes, we needed to respond to their individual need, but also this need to be done to a holistic person-centered approach in order to individualize the uh, management of, of the disease. And with respect to that, of course, we have a number of principal cares, but also we need also to consider what can be done for each one of these elements. So the first element is, for instance, what is the need? in terms of the glycemic control, considering that glycemic control still represented the premium moments in terms of the risk of microvascular complication. And I already mentioned to you to which extent the microvascular complication can impact on the microvascular, cardiovascular risk of people with diabetes. And with that, what we have been suggesting is that control of glycemia can be achieved with different drugs, but also should be considered in terms of using combination therapy earlier on, because there is more rational nowadays to support early combination treatment. Early combination treatment, in fact, is expected to increase the durability of glycemic effects, uh, potentially to address uh, therapeutic inertia, but also it's rational in terms that it really simultaneously tackles multiple pathophysiological processes underlying the chronic development of hyperglycemia in people with type 2 diabetes. But not only that, the combination therapy, consider for instance the fifth combination, can really help it also to reduce the burden of medication in people with type 2 diabetes and to some extent improve adherence and treatment persistence. But what is really key about the combination therapy is the potential complementary clinical benefits. A complementary mechanism that really, because of multiple target, can affect and can have, have a greater effect in more glucose control, but also can help in reducing or controlling body weight. But also now with the drugs that we have available to improve our ability to reduce the cardiovascular risk or to tackle the different cardiovascular risk profile, as well as to prevent or to preserve kidney uh, function. And with that, you know, in the consensus, we have also highlighted what would be the different potency of the drugs that we may have to glycemic control. So glycemic control is key, but also we need to consider what is the need of the person in terms of the weight management. And for the weight management, we have been really trying to attract attention uh, on the, the need uh, to have a greater focus on body weight, to the point that we have been also suggesting that for people that may require, even early on, metabolic surgery should be considered. But all, in any case, we need to combine what is the potential effect on body weight and the glycemic effect in choosing drugs that do have an effect on glycemic control, but also have a significant effect in terms of body weight control. And now we have once again here a sort of a ranking for different drugs that may have different effects in terms of the weight control. Why the need uh, of more focus on body weight? Of course, you know, body weight per se is a cardiovascular risk factors. But let me also uh, remind you that of the lesson that we got from the bariatric surgery, because the bariatric surgery has been suggesting to us that as soon as we do reach a 15 to 20% reduction in the original, in the initial body weight, there is a significant increase that doesn't really increase further by with a further reduction in the body weight in terms of generating the potential for diabetic for diabetes of emission. So it's not just body weight and cardiovascular risk, but it's also body weight and the potential, if it is dealt with from the very beginning of the condition, to induce or to facilitate the potential of remission of diabetes. And of course, also we need to consider what is the cardiovascular risk profile in people with type 2 diabetes. And we have been already discussing a number of these, some potential uh, cardiovascular risk factors. Let me highlight to you that this traditional 
risk factors need to be complemented by the greater role that is going to be played by ectopic fat, particularly in the liver, in Asia, in Naples, which I've been referring to already before, and even more the presence of microvascular complications. So closing the circle between micro and macrovascular complications. And just to give you an example, let me remind you what is the incredible independent effect of a kidney function in the cardiovascular risk in people with a type 2 diabetes. And what you can see here is how the progressive decline in GFR and the progressive increase in administration rate is strongly and highly significantly associated in terms of cardiovascular mortality, in terms of coronary heart disease, but also in terms of heart failure. So preventing the decline and preventing the development of GFR and preventing the, the, the uh, uh, increase in the albuminuria can really translate into a significant improvement in the cardiovascular risk of people with a type 2 diabetes. And nowadays we have better tools to achieve that uh, because we have drugs that independently of glucose can exert some protective effect in terms of the kidney function. And of course, also we need to consider well, what is the uh, situation in terms of their uh, organ damage when we do make the diagnosis of diabetes. And this is very well uh, appreciated, very well accepted. If we have a people with a chronic kidney disease, the current recommendation is to prefer the use of an LGIT2 inhibitor, or if that is not uh, available or feasible or suitable, to consider the use of GIP1 as a drug. If we are dealing with an atherosclerotic cardiovascular condition, then it's either a GLP1 receptor agonist or an SGLP2 that should be considered, both of them uh, with a proven cardiovascular benefits. And if we are dealing with the people with a main problem in terms of heart function and a heart failure, now SGLP2 do have a significant uh, uh, demonstration of a protection with respect to this, uh, uh, to this condition. So this is very well known, it's very well accepted, but what we have been really highlighting in the consensus is that the decision of starting for one of these drugs in the presence of this organ damage condition should be irrespective of the existing treatment. And in particular, should be irrespective of the background metformin because the benefit that is provided by the use of GLT2 uh, uh, inhibitor of GLP-1 receptor agonist is independent of the present informing, as well as this effect, this benefit, is irrespective of the baseline glycemic control. So in other words, the use of this drug in the presence of organ damage should be considered on top of what is their potential effect in terms of glycemic control, because they should be really considered sort of a disease changers uh, because of their uh, potential to improve cardiovascular risk in people with a, a type uh, in people with a type 2 diabetes. So in summary, how should we treat diabetes properly with respect in this specific case of cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic process, and other conditions associated with the heart disease in people with diabetes? Now, uh, what we needed to do is for all I try to convey to you is a holistic person-centered approach uh, in order to really individualize the need without making any specific ranking, but actually bringing everything together to really try to address what is the personal needs for people with a type 2 diabetes. So we have the knowledge, we have the elements, we have the direction, we have the recommendation, we have the tools uh, in order to really have this kind of approach, uh, there's only one thing that we need to do, and I'm uh, stealing uh, this conclusion from my good friend, uh, uh, Professor Chantal Mathieu, saying it's up to us to make it work. And I would like to thank you very much for your kind of thing.